This is the Ministry of Truth. I'm Gordon Comstock. And this is chapter 12 of the History of the Great American Fortunes by Gustavus Myers from 1910. History you're not supposed to know. Chapter 12, Morgan as the, quote, Savior of the Nation, unquote. All previous panegyrics lavished upon Morgan became stale and inadequate compared to the apotheosis of him during the Panic of 1907. What climax of earthly splendor does Morgan reach? He becomes the, quote, savior of the nation, unquote. Around their genesis, methods, and characters, The magnates weave romantic yarns. They supply the inspiration. A host of writers and orators trained to transfer that romancing into catchwords and phrases, carry it to the people, and popularize it until it becomes an almost adamantine tradition. Always it is the same species of romance, the toil the thrift, the integrity, the wonderful ability by which the magnates reaped their fortunes, their heroism in time of war, their saving philanthropy in all great crises. The audacity of these quote-unquote literary puffers is as great as the imposture of the magnates whom they cover with adulation. In the very commission of vast frauds and thefts, the magnates will pose as public-spirited, patriotic men. Their puffers hasten to paint them likewise. There is no judicious waiting until time has receded and the actual facts are more or less forgotten. The very enormities of the magnates are at once transformed into acts of the greatest purity, and the people are called upon to applaud. In every conceivable manner, the press, or at least a considerable section of it, is manipulated to counteract the effect of disclosures. A characteristic eulogy of Morgan. Shortly after the panic of 1907 had set in, an article, and it was one of many such productions, entitled Morgan the Magnificent, was published in a quote-unquote popular magazine. Its bombastic style, if nothing else, must provoke a wondering interest. Yet it was strictly in accord with the quality of most of the matter published in books and magazines. This trash was called quote-unquote popular, not because the people wanted it, but because, to a great extent, many publishers considered it quote-unquote safe. It did not antagonize the vested interests of wealth. The article began with this lurid introduction, quote, There were scenes in the saving of Wall Street by John Pierpont Morgan that can never be written, things said and done that cannot and should not even be remembered, Even in those days of excitement, horror, and confusion, heroism, crimes, blunders, treacheries, and martyrdoms that spanned the whole capacity of man for glory or shame. For, until the continent came, half crying, half cursing, out of the trembling madness that threatened to bring down the banking system of the country into ruins, smash the credit of the nation, and smirch its name, Men were in a nameless bewilderment of fear beyond words to express, as in the presence of some impending and irresistible convulsion of nature, the boldest and keenest become craven and stupid. Plain Mr. Morgan, fresh from the dronings of a great Episcopal church convention at Richmond, was suddenly aroused by the peril of the financial situation to a demonstration of courage. <laughs> is he going to get in a phone booth and, and change into a cape with an S on his gesture? Strength and personal masterfulness that brought order and confidence out of chaos and despair. Thank you, Superman. 
and there is a little history to compare to the sight of this stout, secretive American banker of 70 years withdrawing from the passionless company of bishops and ministers intent on religious ideals to take command of the fierce, clashing money forces of Wall Street, gone crazy out of sheer fright, to become the protagonist and hero of the most cynical, suspicious, treacherous, cruel, arrogant, and cowardly human elements of the world. My hero. <laughs> Unquote. Wow. It might well be imagined that Morgan, the, quote, connoisseur of art, unquote, the, quote, lover of literature, unquote, the great arbiter elegantarium, would have sent for the author of this perpetration and caused him to be bastionadoed on the spot. Evidently, in the absence of proof to the contrary, Morgan was pleased with the confection. It would not be worth notice here were it not for the fact that the point of it, that Morgan was the, quote, savior of the nation, unquote, was gravely and repeatedly pressed forward by many other writers and publications. In scrutinizing Morgan's career, one prodigious virtue is encountered. It is that of consistency. The quality of his patriotism and heroism never changed from the time of his introduction into business. That rifle sale at the outbreak of the Civil War was the first exhibition of his intense patriotism. In 1894, his patriotic nature was again displayed consistently when he and his clique squeezed a profit of $18 million or more from the government in a time of need. In the panic of 1907, his never-failing patriotism was even more prominently shown. While the effusions of the quote-unquote popular writers were wending the rounds of the country, a recalcitrant United States senator was boring the august Senate of the United States with a long, tiresome speech. The bulk of the august Senate did not care to hear what this senator, one La Follette of Wisconsin had to say, and were compelled to it by the rules. The Senate of the United States was most sensitively jealous of its prestige and dignity. Most of its members were multimillionaires. La Follette lacked that highly important qualification. Still more, he was painfully deficient in caste in another respect. He had not bought his way into the Senate of the United States, thereby outraging one of its most sacred canons. Hence, he could give no real test of standing or any guarantee of wise conservative statesmanship. But the majority of his colleagues had good reason to be impatient of La Follette's speech. His was a voice from the past. They represented the newer order, that of centralized industry, and a government run directly by the magnates themselves. There it is, folks. He was a relic of the old creed, that of the age of competition in industry. For four long days, on March 17th, 19th, 24th and 29th, 1908, he delivered his lugubrious wail. Quote, In their strife for more money, more power, more power, more money, unquote, he explained in describing the great magnates, quote, There is no time for thought, for reflection. Government, society, and the individual are swallowed up in the struggle for greater control, unquote. Thus he stumbled through mazes of facts, the purport and interpretation of which he did not understand. Neither did he comprehend the fundamental fact that commercial upheavals are not the work of individuals, 
but of the whole capitalist system. That certain powerful individuals or interests could accelerate or retard them, but could not be held responsible for their causation. According to him, a crowd of conspirators headed by the Standard Oil Company and Morgan had deliberately brought on the panic. He fulminated against them and denounced them as arch-criminals. Amid his accusations, lamentations, and platitudes, Senator La Follette embodied certain facts of real historic value, facts confirmed by the records of what actually took place and familiar to all close observers of events during the panic. The Panic of 1907, like previous panics, supplied the propitious opportunity to the great magnates to crush out lesser magnates and seize the control of their property. The requirements of industrial centralization demanded the effacement of certain minor magnate groups which, from the point of view of the great magnates, had possessed themselves of a rather dangerous degree of industrial and financial power. These ambitious little magnates had imitated the methods of the great. They had combined fraudulent financial manipulation with the oppressive exercise of political power, and thereby had tricked or forced out the owners of various properties and had then vested the ownership of those properties in themselves. The form was the usual one of organizing large corporations with immense amounts of watered stock. These corporations were built upon the ruin, extinguishment, or buying out of numbers of former independent businessmen how the little magnates get their millions. One of these minor capitalist cliques was what was called the, quote, Heinz Morse Thomas Group, unquote. Its control comprised 12 banks and two trust companies, a coastwise steamship company consolidated by the inclusion of a number of steamship companies, large copper mines, a trust in ice, and various other properties. The control of some of these properties was largely secured by means of the enormous profits robbed from the poor by the exactions of the ICE Trust. And this robbery was made possible and easy by means of a corrupt alliance between Morse and the Tammany administration in New York City. Before organizing the ICE Trust, Morse had been an inconspicuous banker. In the course of this business, he had dealings in discounting the notes of various individuals and firms engaged in the selling of ice. Conceiving the idea of forming a trust in that necessity, he set about to crush out the small dealers. One of his first steps was to assure himself of the collusion of powerful politicians ruling the government in New York City. In its investigation of the administration of New York City, the Mazet Committee, an investigating body appointed by the legislature in 1899, exposed the conspiracy between the ICE Trust on the one hand and on the other the dock and other municipal departments, to create and maintain a monopoly of New York's ice supply. Mayor Van Wyck, a puppet of the Big Tammany leaders, subsequently admitted in his testimony before Judge Gaynor of the New York Supreme Court that he had obtained 5,000 shares worth $500,000 of ice trust stock. He alleged that he had paid $57,000 in cash for them. Pressed for proof to substantiate his statement, he failed to prove that he had actually paid anything. The testimony before the Mazet Committee conclusively showed that 
the corrupt arrangement between the ICE Trust and the city officials was such as to compel the people to pay 60 cents a hundred pounds and that the trust had stopped the sale of five cent pieces of ice, practically cutting off the supply for the very poor. With its assured monopoly, the ice trust declined to make the slightest concession. Millions from suffering, disease, and death. The result was a noticeably great increase in the rate of mortality among the children of the poor. Large numbers of families living on the most precarious edge of destitution could not afford to pay the extra five cents demanded for a piece of ice. The milk soured and acted like poison on the children. The increasing number of deaths in successive summers when the terrific heat made ice an absolute necessity especially in the congested tenements, could be traced in large part to the methods of the ice trust. Millions of other people who could ill afford to pay the exactions demanded were compelled to give up extra tribute or go without ice. This was not a temporary condition. It has continued so ever since the organization of the ice trust. The methods then adopted prevail now. Neither were the methods any different from those of capitalism in every field. The invariable principle upon which capitalists acted, and by which they tremendously augmented their profits, was to sell necessities at the very highest price when the people needed them most. In the depths of winter, the price of coal was always raised to an exorbitant point. While giving his bits of donations for the founding of hospitals, the successful capitalist reaped his millions from conditions productive of vast suffering and disease on every hand. The more profits that he made, the more of a financial genius he was accounted by his class and by all who were influenced by the standards of that class. As soon as Morse proved that he could exact immense profits, he was hailed as a very foremost and successful capitalist. The newspapers began giving extended notices of him. The price of ice trust stock went up in Wall Street, and fine men and women in elegant society were only too eager to get hold of stock paying such rich dividends. True, charges of violating the law were made against Morse and his associates, but those charges were not based upon any concern for the masses of people, nor upon any indignation at the privations, suffering, and deaths caused by the methods of the ice trust. They were made solely on behalf of the smaller firms whom Morse had forced out of business. Jerome, for some years district attorney for New York County, could discover no criminality in any of Morse's methods and caused criminal proceedings brought against the ice trust officials to be dismissed. A suit, however, brought by the Attorney General of New York State against the Ice Trust for violation of the State Anti-Monopoly Act is now pending. From this process of exaction and indirect murder on a great scale, the Ice Trust's profits became very great. The money thus taken in, Morse used to finance other enterprises buying up the control of a number of coastwise steamship lines, he consolidated them into one corporation with the familiar accompaniments of stock watering and juggling. He applied himself with the Heinzes, who owned large copper mines in Montana, and whose manipulation of the politics and politicians of that state was somewhat similar to that Morse used in New York City. 
Also, he made a coalition with Thomas, who controlled some New York banks. On the surface, this seemed a very powerful combination. Not an opportunity was lost by Morse and his associates to spread abroad the impression that they were too formidable to be overthrown. The great magnates lie in ambush. These men made much noise in the financial world and dashed around with prodigious belief in their invincibility. They were vaunted as great financiers. Doubtless inflated by their own success, they esteemed themselves so and judged themselves fully able to cope with the great magnates. In the meantime, the Morgan and Rockefeller group was carefully observing their operations and awaiting the right time when they could be crushed out at one blow. The Standard Oil Company wanted those copper mines, and the steamship company organized by Morse was considered a competitive menace to railroad lines controlled by the Morgan and Rockefeller interests. Senator La Follette's account of events that followed was accurate as to the facts. In his speech in the United States Senate, he gave this narrative, quote, Suddenly, in the first days of October, somebody, to use a Wall Street phrase, began to smash United Copper on the curb, so they said. The stock broke badly. Standard Oil was getting underway. Doubtless, never suspecting the source, Hines, through his brother, a member of the stock exchange, and through brokers, bought and bought until United Copper went out of sight, carrying down Hines's brother, one firm of his brokers, and involving the Morse Hines banks in the crash. Up to this point, the panic had been well in hand. But with the revelations following hard upon clearinghouse investigations, it slipped its bridle, and the situation assumed a serious aspect. But not for one moment did Morgan or Standard Oil miss the opportunity offered. Morse and Hines were forced out. They were compelled to reorganize their directorships and substitute semi-dependent Standard Oil men as their successors. They were forced to sell their stocks for what they could get. Morgan attacked Morse's consolidated steamship company stocks and bonds, and Morse was ultimately forced to surrender his steamship company combine, which he did. They went after Knickerbocker Trust Company, Charles T. Barney, president, and ally closely of Morse's. It was charged in New York that the interests deliberately started a run on the Knickerbocker. Morgan was appealed to for aid. Morgan, whose plaudits have been sounded right here in this chamber, was in a position to follow carefully every step and phase of this proceeding. In the first place, Morgan gave out, as reported in Wall Street, that the Knickerbocker would be supported if it met the demands of the depositors who had started a run upon it. There was nothing in subsequent events to indicate that there was any sincerity in that promise but an analysis of every step is convincing to the contrary. Support was not given. It was withheld. After the company, relying upon that pledge, had paid out millions, it was forced to close its doors, and Barney went to a suicide's grave. Barney was likewise a director in the Trust Company of America, a comparatively new institution with a few system directors, giving the great groups a semi-interest in the institution, though they had not yet taken it over. The raid of Hines, Morse, Barney et al., and the latter's directorate connections with the Trust Company of America caused public suspicion to fall upon it. A strong run was started. This was not on the program, but as the Vanderbilts, allies of the Standard Oil, were represented on the directorate of the Trust Company of America, Standard Oil was bound to offer some assistance. Though gold and banknotes were ostentatiously piled on the counters to impress depositors, and young Vanderbilt offered as an exhibit of resources and placed at the teller's window, the excited depositors persisted in demanding their money." Unquote. 
In a day, as it were, the Morse Heinz Thomas group was smashed into nothingness and its properties seized. If the experience of those venturesome little magnates had ended there, they would have had cause to rejoice over their good fortune. But their route had to be made complete. The federal authorities began to take a sudden interest in their operations, where previously the government's prosecuting officials had been wholly unaware that Morse, Hines, and Thomas had been committing fraud in their financial methods, they now spied out the fullest evidences. From certain quarters, proofs were offered of violations of the law by the fallen trio. The United States District Attorney's Office in New York City became alive with energy. It caused grand jurors to investigate and showed striking official zeal in the prosecution. Hines was indicted and Morse brought to trial, convicted, and sentenced to 15 years in prison, a verdict from which he appealed. The United States Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the verdict, and Morse is now serving his term in the federal prison at Atlanta. Morse and Hines learned two valuable lessons which all aspiring little magnates might well take to heart. First, that it is extremely unwise to cross the interests of the really big magnates, and second, that those magnates can use the criminal machinery of the courts against opponents of their own class, not less than against labor leaders, labor unions, and the propertyless in general. But the grasping of the properties of the ousted combination were not the only seizures during those harvest days of the Panic of 1907. The electric apparatus factories of the Westinghouse Company had long been in the way of the Standard Oil Company, which owned the General Electric Company. The Standard Oil Company exercised a financial pressure during the panic that soon drove the Westinghouse Company into an extrication, from which it escaped only by becoming a Standard Oil property. And in the conferences held by the Wall Street financiers during the early days of the panic, Morgan learned that the control of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company in the form of stock had been placed with the Trust Company of America by John W. Gates and his associates to secure loans. This was information of the highest and most momentous value. Okay, we're stopping here, and uh, we're going to take a break. See you in about three minutes. Okay, we're back, and uh, let's resume chapter 12 of volume 4 of the history of the great American fortunes by Gustavus Myers from 1910. The Steel Trust absorbs a dangerous competitor. The Tennessee Coal and Iron Company was the most dangerous competitor of the Steel Trust. It was the one great competitor having its own sources of iron ore and coal supply. In the fall of 1907, it owned, it was estimated, from 500 million to 700 million tons of iron ore and 2 billion tons of coal and, quote, very large quantities of flux and fluxing material, unquote. All of these coal deposits were within a radius of 30 miles of its plant in Birmingham, Alabama. The owners of this company were planning improvements which would have made it an even more serious competitor of the Steel Trust, and they had plans underway of merging the Republic Steel Company with their corporation. Moreover, the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company was foremost in the development of the open hearth system of making steel rails. Its rails were in greater demand and brought higher prices than those of the Steel Trust. In the difficult financial position of the Trust Company of America, the Morgan and Rockefeller interests, working in unison, saw their great opportunity 
of eliminating the competition of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company. To prevent itself going into bankruptcy, the Trust Company of America needed large and immediate amounts of cash, which was scarce. Morgan and his clique had the cash. The condition insisted upon by Morgan was that the company should sell him the stock of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company that it was holding as collateral for loans. Hard-pressed, the trust company had to yield and sell the stock at the low price offered. The next move was to make the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company a part of the Steel Trust. There was, however, an obstacle. The federal antitrust law prohibited such combinations. How could this situation be overcome? President Theodore Roosevelt was incessantly and gustily threatening the great magnates with the enforcement of this law. But apparently Morgan knew Roosevelt much better than the country knew him. He undoubtedly reckoned that Roosevelt's talk was mere words and that Roosevelt would prove his subservience anew in actions. The report went that Morgan, through emissaries sent to the White House, informed Roosevelt that unless the merger of the two steel companies was allowed by the government, the Trust Company of America would go down in failure, causing a train of other bankruptcies, and the panic would be manifold intensified, the same old threat, same old threat the bankers always use. Whatever were the reasons for Roosevelt's submission, he gave his consent. At that very time, the courts were enforcing the antitrust law with a construction that no one had dreamed of when the law was passed. The eminent judges discovered that labor unions were trusts, <laughs> of course, and issued writs against them on the ground that they were conspiracies in defiance of that law. Oh, woe to you, rich men. Someday you'll get yours. Roosevelt was bitterly denounced. His action, however, mattered little so far as the merging of the two corporations was concerned. Had not the Steel Trust obtained control at that particular time, it would have inevitably done so at some other time, and by another process. According to disclosures before the Senate Committee on Judiciary, the Steel Trust made a profit of $670 million by forcing the Trust Company of America to sell the control of the enormously valuable plants and mines of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company at a preposterously low price. Where did Morgan and his associates get the money with which to carry on the process of terrorizing the country and gathering in immense industrial and other properties? Again, the people had another of those frequently occurring vivid opportunities of seeing how thoroughly the United States government was an instrument of the capitalists. In the banks, there were more than $200 million of money wrung fundamentally from the sweat of the working class in taxation. The few oligarchs controlling the great banks were allowed to use this money as though it were their private property. They declined to loan any money to anyone until their plans were ready, and when they did loan, it was at extortionate rates of interest. Even this complete transference of government funds did not satisfy them. They demanded more. The government at once responded. Cortelieu, Secretary of the Treasury, instantly permitted the national banks to issue $30 million more in paper currency 
and made the mints work night and day to turn out fresh coin. Posing as the savior of the country, Morgan came forward at the auspicious time on the afternoon of October 24th, 1907, and magnanimously announced his desire to, quote, relieve the tension, unquote. The entire capitalist class, excepting the very few magnates thus engineering the whole situation, was clamoring for loans of money. The loans were finally given on that afternoon. The, quote, savior of the country, unquote, demanded from 20% upwards for loans and exacted securities as collateral at heavy sacrifices to the borrowers. The money that he thus loaned was government money squeezed in taxation from the producers. It was a classic example of government of, for, and by the great capitalists. No aid for the unemployed. While the government was placing the treasury of the United States at the disposal of Morgan, what was it doing for the millions of workers thrown into enforced idleness and destitution? By June 1908, it was conservatively estimated that perhaps five million workers in the United States were out of work and could get none. Reports from the charity organizations in every city showed that the cities were overcrowded with the homeless and unemployed. Destitution was rife, and cases of starvation of men, women, and children were more frequent than the official reports dared reveal. The jails throughout the country were crowded with men who, thrown out of work, were adjudged vagrants and sentenced. Many of the homeless voluntarily committed some breach of the law in order to be sent to jail. There, at least, shelter and food could be obtained. Many towns adopted the plan of deliberately driving out the unemployed. Everywhere crime increased. Driven to absolute necessity, Many workers stole and, of course, were dispatched to prison. The Social Ethical League of New York City reported that crime had increased 50% within six months. With destitution and starvation everywhere, what did the government, whether national, state, or city, do for the unemployed? Nothing except to club and terrorize them when they presumed to hold street meetings to plead for the right to work. In the whole sphere of government, there was not a single real representative of the workers to speak or act for the workers. The government was a government elected by the votes of millions of working men, yet the working class did not have a single mouthpiece in that government. A senator such as Davis of Arkansas might rise, as he did, in the United States Senate on December 12, 1907, and fiercely denounce, quote, the stock gamblers and thieves of Wall Street, unquote. But he, and all like him, did not speak for the working class, about which they cared nothing save to keep it in submission. They spoke for the middle class, and for that alone. A career still in evidence. This is the true history, in outline, of the career of the great, quote, savior of the country, unquote. But it is not all. Unquestionably, Morgan has been engaged in a large number of other transactions of which no details have ever become public. Some very recent happenings, however, are tolerably well known. He and other American bankers were dissatisfied with the placing of a $27 million, $500,000 loan with European bankers and insisted upon the United States government, their government, 
demanding that they should have a share. Nor is it so long ago that another transaction of Morgan's became public. He, quote-unquote, consented to take a $30 million 6% issue of New York City's bonds in order, quote, to save New York's credit, unquote. Did he pay for these bonds in cash? Nay, he signed a check for $15 million on the First National Bank of New York and another for $15 million drawn on the National City Bank of New York. Whose money, virtually, was it in these banks against which Morgan's checks were drawn? Money deposited by the United States Treasury. In addition, he obtained tens of millions more of New York City bonds at a high rate of interest. The heroic qualities of the, quote, savior of the country, unquote, are further illumined by Comptroller Metz's statement that he, Metz, in order to get Morgan to accept New York City's bonds, had to betake himself to Albany and get a special act passed by the legislature, increasing the interest on the bonds. Another such illustration of Morgan's methods, or those of corporations controlled by him, will be given. At an expense of more than $22 million, reckoned in November 1909, New York City has constructed a series of extensive modern piers on the Hudson River, from Little West 12th Street to 22nd Street, these piers are called the Chelsea Pier Improvements. The entire cost has been defrayed by New York City, and the money was obtained by selling issues of city bonds. The interest rate has varied from 3 to nearly 5%. Part of the bonds are payable in 30 years, a very small portion in 40 years, and most of the total issue quote-unquote, matures in 50 years. These piers have been leased to three steamship companies, one of which is the International Mercantile Marine Company, organized by Morgan, another is the Cunard Line, a third, the Compagni General Transatlantique. These companies secured from the Tammany administration in 1904 a lease of such a scandalous character that the city does not get enough revenue to pay even the interest on the bonds issued for the peers. On December 16, 1903, the International Mercantile Marine Company offered, in writing, to take a lease of five full peers and one half peer at an annual rental of $450,000. The question of awarding this lease was still pending when Tammany came back into power. The International Mercantile Company then secured the return of its first offer, and a 30-year lease was made later by which the three companies secured nine peers at an annual rental of $565,000. Inasmuch as the International Mercantile Marine Company alone had originally been willing to offer $3,392,351.46 for the nine peers for a 30-year period, this change in the terms entailed a loss to the city of nearly $3 million. The result can be stated as follows. The Chelsea improvements have cost the city $22 million. The annual interest charges that the city is required to meet are $844,800. The amortization charges are 220000 The calculated annual depreciation is $345,553.50. The total annual charges are, therefore, $1,410,353.50. The annual rent received from steamship companies for these piers 
is $565,000. Hence, the net loss per annum to the city is $845,353.50. The loss to the city per day is $2,000. $316.04. Thus, New York's officials were prevailed upon to lease the largest and finest piers in New York, if not in the United States, at a lower rental than the city had been receiving for older and far inferior piers, so that New York City loses 845 thousand three hundred fifty three dollars and fifty cents every year and while Morgan's International Mercantile Marine Company was profiting by this transaction Morgan was giving twenty thousand dollars a year to the Bureau of Municipal Research to investigate and expose petty graft comment is needless these transactions however are small compared to Morgan's still more recent activities. On December 2nd, 1909, Morgan personally bought the majority stock of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, which Thomas F. Ryan, in 1905, had purchased from the Hyde family. By this purchase, Morgan acquired the ownership of the stock around which revolved such a bitter contest for possession four years previously. A contest which, as already described, caused the great insurance scandals and revelations of 1905. By the purchase of this stock, Morgan obtained control of assets rated at $470 million. He paid, it was reported, approximately 2500000 for Ryan's stock. Thirteen days after this purchase, he bought a number of telephone lines competitors of the Bell Telephone Company, probably to unite them with the Bell system. A legislative committee in Ohio has been investigating charges that bribery was used to pass a bill allowing this merger. Morgan's next step revealed how rapidly he was extending his already gigantic power. By purchase, combination, or, quote, community of interest, unquote, he acquired the Guarantee Trust Company of New York, a $90 million concern. The Mercantile Trust Company, with resources of $68,475,000. The Equitable Trust Company, with assets of $63,800,000. The Morton Trust Company, formerly controlled by Ryan, the Fifth Avenue Trust Company, and other very powerful banking institutions. Morgan's power now embraces banking and trust, insurance, industrial, and transportation companies, and controls or influences capital estimated at the very least at more than ten billions of dollars. How much of this stupendous sum Morgan personally owns or controls, or what alliance he has with the Rockefellers or other great money interests, are factors not definitely known. After consummating this money trust, he was hailed as the quote-unquote money emperor, and his immense possessions were denounced as an impressive and ruthless example of one-man power although the step was, in reality, another inevitable bound in the centralization and overlordship of the country's resources. Only those blind to this development were astonished by it. Finally, to end the narrative of Morgan's career, there remains the huge expropriation of resources, estimated at a value of from $900 million to two billion dollars in Alaska and of vast stretches of water power sites in that territory and in various of the western states. 
sites intrinsically and potentially valued at hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars. The successful efforts underway on the part of great capitalist interests to obtain immense stretches of coal, copper, and other mineral land, timberlands, and water power sites were resisted by Gifford Pinchot, United States Chief Forester. A critical controversy ensued in 1909 and 1910 between Pinchot and Ballinger, Secretary of the Interior. Charges were made that Ballinger had, before his prior appointment as Land Commissioner, acted as attorney for certain of the claimants, especially the Cunninghams, who had obtained great tracts of land of the most valuable resources. A congressional investigation resulted. This investigation is still, as of this writing, going on. Many facts, however, popularly regarded as startling, have already been brought out. In no sense, however, were they other, at basis, than a continued story of the fraudulent appropriation of public lands which has been going on in this country for three centuries. Pinchot and L. R. Glavis, chief of the field division of the General Land Office at Seattle, Washington, were, upon various pretexts, dismissed from office after they had exposed and vainly sought to stop the gigantic land frauds in progress. This, as we have so copiously seen throughout this work, has been the fate of so many honest public officials obstructing capitalist fraud. On January 28, 1910, Glavis testified before the Joint Committee of Congress that he had been requested by Ballinger to hold up his investigations of fraud until after the election of 1908, and that Ballinger supplied secret information of the U.S. Land Office to the Cunningham claimants who, the testimony showed, were dummies acting for the Guggenheims. Some of the charges made by Glavis were confirmed in a rather unexpected manner. It appeared by an authoritative statement that J.P. Morgan and Company had formed a syndicate with the Guggenheims in 1906, and that they had taken over the Cunningham claims. On February 18, 1910, John N. Steele, general counsel of the syndicate, and Stephen Birch, its managing director in Alaska, voluntarily appeared before the Joint Committee of Congress and made this statement, also denying that the syndicate had ever received money, grants of land, or special rights from the government. In its own defense, the General Land Office, on January 26, 1910, ostentatiously made a public statement evidently intended to discredit Pinchot, showing that the most extensive land frauds had been consummated in the years immediately preceding the Taft administration, that within eight years 50,000 acres of coal lands, valued at $10 million, had been obtained by fraud, and that it was expected to recover these 50,000 acres. Inasmuch as the Joint Investigating Committee of Congress has not concluded taking testimony, its report is not available, and Ballinger's full defense cannot therefore be given. The testimony taken thus far, however, has tended to show the most enormous frauds in either the successful or attempted acquiring, through dummies, of mineral, timber, and water power lands valued at hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, thus showing that the seizing of land, begun in settlement times, has continued through more than three centuries up to the very present without 
any serious interruption. This entire country, folks, is a history of fraud. It's all a, a lie. It's we're not a Christian nation. It's that's a fairy tale. There were some Christians who moved in here, but the country's by and large it's it's been a, operated run by frauds. Final paragraph. Commencing his career with the sale of those condemned rifles to the Union Army during the Civil War, Morgan has prospered until he now towers as a financial colossus and as one of the actual rulers of the land. He lives in a splendid mansion on Madison Avenue, New York City, and for his private gratification, built adjoining it a fine, spacious marble art gallery filled with the costliest works of art. He professes a passion for literature, and his library is extensive. He is even a dictator of the morals of other people, as witness his stopping of the opera Salome when it was first produced at the Metropolitan Opera House, of which he is a patron and director. Money, grandeur, prestige, power, all are his. And all the while, the prisons are crowded with petty thieves. Oh, wow. The big thieves get away. And they always have. And that is the history of this country. Uh, the big thieves are the rulers of this country. Okay, this has been Chapter 12 of Volume 4 of the History of the Great American Fortunes by Gustavus Myers from 1910. I'm Gordon Comstock. This is the Ministry of Truth. Over and out. <laughs>